Well, it's always, we always welcome the opportunity to be with you and to speak with you. I want you to go back in time with me. I want you to go back in time, way back in time. How many of you remember the Wayback Machine with Professor Peabody? Who was who his sidekick? German, very good. At least two of us are over 90. Um, yeah, Professor Peabody and Sherman had this thing called the Wayback Machine. And the Wayback Machine would go. There you go. See, you, you were there. You're with me. But I want you to go back to the 30s AD in Jerusalem, near the temple precinct. It's been, it's been seven weeks, plus a bit, from Passover in the days of unleavened bread, from the wave sheaf, as now. I want you to consider yourself one of the members of the Judaic community. You're a believer. Possibly you've come from Parthia. Parthia is one of the countries mentioned. It's in Iran. It takes two or more weeks to pilgrimage to Jerusalem to be there for the festival of Shavuot. Possibly you speak some Aramaic, a little bit of Greek, maybe a little Hebrew, plus your local dialect. You cultivate grapes, and you've tithed on those grapes so that you can go up to Jerusalem for this feast. You heard of this prophet in Jerusalem. He claimed he was the Messiah. You know very little except that he was killed. Possibly you're someone that lives in Jerusalem during the feast. You have seen this prophet Jesus. You saw him from afar after his, his death. You saw him alive after the resurrection. At Passover, he was the wave sheaf, during the wave sheaf of the barley harvest. Keep in mind, I'm going to assume that you know Leviticus chapter 23 in Deuteronomy. That's why you're here. You're here to celebrate the festival of Shavuot or Pentecost. And there's both a theological as well as a practical aspect. It's the harvesting of crops. First, the barley harvest in the spring, and then late spring is wheat. Two harvests with first fruits on each, an offering. So this is a pilgrimage feast in Jerusalem because the command was to go up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is packed with thousands and thousands of people. So on this day, this very special day, the only day that is not mentioned with a month and a day. In other words, this day is not in the sixth month on the first day, on the third month on the second day. It's a count. It's very different. We'll attempt to relive and to understand what God gave to a few people of extremely humble origins with no formal training to do unimaginable things. Turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 1. We are going to spend the majority of our time in Acts. I want to remind you, as I do the people in uh, Los Angeles, you know what? Technically, we're not Los Angeles anymore. Yeah, that's right. What are we now? No, no, no. Hollywood, baby. Hollywood. <laughs> We're going to take advantage of this. When I go back to the conference, by the way, I always say, aren't you from L.A.? And I said, no, from Hollywood, baby. Hollywood. <laughs> you should see the reaction. It's very troubling. In Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, Luke writes, he says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles. We heard about commandments in the first message. Whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he, Jesus, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, and this is some of the last if you have a red letter Bible, this is the last section of red letter speaking by Jesus Christ in the Bible. Some of the very last. He said, you have heard from me for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, right, they're always, the disciples are always quick on the uptake, right? He's just telling them, wait in Jerusalem, you're going to get baptized not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. They come back with the question, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? What did that have to do with what he just said? Nothing. Nothing. So he repeats himself. He said, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons, which the Father has put in his own authority. But 
You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come down upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. They would be given a very, very special power. The prepositions are interesting here. It says the Holy, descend, the Holy Spirit would descend on them. But we're going to read that the prepositions are secondary. They're distinctions without a difference. Turn with me if, uh, to, to uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> turn with me to chap chapter 2. In chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. This sound from heaven was as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and of one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is exactly the fulfillment of the prophecy that Jesus had given them. He didn't go into the details of the tongues, but he said you would be given power. And this is exactly what happened. We mentioned these prepositions. To be on is to be in. I once had a conversation with another individual, not here, and he said, well, the Spirit was on people, but not in them. What? On is in. In is on. The effect is very much the very same thing. It says that the word, you'll see the words tongues, which is glossa, and other tongues other than their own. And it got very, very loud. So I want you to picture this. They're in this room. Many think it may have been the upper room where the Last Supper, the last Passover with Jesus was occurring, but it, there were other people there. It's hard to, hard to say. In verse 5, it says, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Again, a reference to what Jesus had prophesied to them. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongue the wonderful words of God. They were all amazed, perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others said, they're drunk. 13, they're full of new wine. They're drunk. This is crazy. They heard sounds and words coming out of the house. Did they move to the street? We don't know. If they didn't move to the street and the people on the street heard them, that's how loud they got. They got real loud. They heard them speak, these people did, in their own language. Possibly they did move out and they saw them. They referenced the Galileans. This is an interesting inference. The inference is that the language of the Galileans were not quite their forte. The Galileans were not known as really bright. They were peasants. Uh, one commentator, Tenney, says they had trouble with guttural sounds, whatever that means. I looked that up and I still didn't understand it. They had trouble speaking. They swallowed their syllables. They were mumblers, right? Very difficult to understand. The inference is they were peasants, simple folk. I can relate. I can relate. I grew up in this valley, in the San Gabriel Valley, not too far from here, in Rosemead. How many of you have ever been to Rosemead? Oh, really? You kept right on driving, didn't you? OK. <laughs> I literally grew up below the tracks. How do I know that? The people from Temple City. How many of you people live in Temple City? Good. The people in Temple City would remind me, oh, Rosemead, that's below the tracks, literally. I said, yes, it's, that's the northern line is the, is the railroad track. Oh, I played football here with people from Arcadia. <laughs> people in Rosemead wanted to be people in Temple City. People in Temple City wanted to be people in Arcadia. People in Arcadia wanted to be people in San Marino. And the people in San Marino wanted everybody else just go away, <laughs> go away. I don't think it's changed as it changed. 
No, I'm seeing head shake. In fact, every time we come to the Arcadia Community Center, there's a football field across the street. I think I may have referenced it. But my heart starts to palpitate as we come down the, the road here and we get closer. And Becky has to tell me, honey, just deep breaths, deep breaths. I played on that field. We never won a game. <laughs> we barely scored. When we showed up, Arcadia would ask, are these the tackling dummies or the junior varsity from Rosemead? <laughs> so the word Galilean to me means peasant. They were peasants. They were simple people. And they were using or being given this unbelievable speech. I believe it was the gift of tongues, not the gift of ears. It was the speaking they were being given. Languages are hard. They're very difficult. How many of you know a second Nala language? A lot of you. A third? A few of you? We had, with our children, we asked them to take at least, at least two languages, and they all three did. One chose, are you ready? Spanish, by the way, as you might know in, in, uh, in years past, was, Spanish was uh, obligatory in elementary school. So one chose Japanese, one chose Italian, and the third chose German. I'm not telling you which kid chose what. It's, uh, it's real, it was really interesting in our house. But the disciples knew some languages, but they were not Dr. Peter. They were not Dr. Matthew. They were not Dr. Thaddeus, Dean of Semitic Languages with undergraduate postdoctoral studies. These were fishermen. They weren't rabbis. They weren't priests. They were Roman tax collectors. Most of the disciples, we really don't even know what they did. That's how unimportant it was. But they were very, indeed, very much simple people. And they were from Galilee. They were very simple people. Verse 12 says, everyone was amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? What could this mean? What's also interesting, there is a verse, a phrase embedded in this section, which is, I think, rarely fleshed out. And I believe that this, this simple little phrase in there is what the entire chapter pivots on. It's that important. It's the phrase in verse 11, the wonderful works of God. That is what they said. The languages is what we focus on. But that wasn't what's important. When, when you speak in another language, it's the words that you're trying to communicate that are of prime importance, no? If any of you that do speak multiple languages and you go to that foreign country, you try and communicate them with them in that language, not with your English. You try and communicate. You, you want an exchange. You, you want them to understand what you're trying to say. And so it is here. And this phrase, this phrase, the wonderful works of God, that's all it says. We had at least one hymn this morning that we sang that referenced that. The wonderful things that God has done. Well, what is that? That could be many, many things. Anything. Some commentators say that they were psalms, which is very common during the, the time of Pentecost for Jews. They will recite the psalms as a part of their ceremonies during this time. I think understanding what those words were, which we will read about very clearly in this chapter, makes all the difference. Now, I want you to hold your hand in uh, Acts chapter 2, and I want you to move with me to, uh, to John. And we're going to go to John chapter 14. When Jesus was with the disciples, when Jesus was with the disciples, in verse 15, he says something very important. In fact, we had special music to this very effect uh, from Thomas Tallis yesterday. Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, he and I will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. This concept, this concept, let's go back to Acts, of what God has done, these works of God are so important. And so we have, 
the words of Jesus on the disciples' minds. It had just been a few weeks. They now were imbued with power from on high to speak in other languages, to communicate to the multitudes that are there. And the words that they say are important. The, resp the response of the audience is confused. They don't understand. How can these men, what are they talking about? Why are they using these languages? And we hear it. Peter, in verse 14 of Acts chapter 2, responds. What's important as we read about this is that Peter is a fisherman. I want you to go back and place yourself in that way back machine and remember who he is, what he is in the last few weeks of Peter's life. Peter gives a highly structured, as we will see, point-counterpoint, highly directed message based upon the wonderful works of God. Verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For they are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. I don't know what the inference there is. If it were later in the day, they would be, they'd be drunk. So I don't know if that's part of a warm-up joke or how we're to interpret that, but it's, uh, it's a really interesting line. These guys aren't drunk. I'm always amazed that the, the Bible doesn't give us facial expressions. They're, I agree with Mr. Helge, God does have facial recognition, but the software just doesn't come through here. I would love to see what their reactions were to the, to the comments. They're not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is that, or this is what, which is a very important phrase, verse 16. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall see dream, dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, the sun and the, the blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. These are important, very important words of this prophecy. It's at least being partially fulfilled. I want you to remember what had heard, occurred in Jerusalem during the time of Passover and the days of unbread. Many of these happened, and now there is a prophecy being fulfilled of God's Spirit descending. He tells them what this is. These men are speaking because His Spirit has been poured out on them with power. And he references wonders in heaven and signs in the earth. These are by God, and they for attest to the miracles and the wonders of God. The very thing that they were talking about in many of these languages. I will pour out my spirit is point one. I will show wonders in heaven and signs on the earth, point two. Point three, those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How does this apply to Pentecost? How does this message, which is so important, and it takes up the bulk of chapter 2 that we consider the beginning of Pentecost in the New Testament. And yet we focus on the languages. We focus on the, the amazement. But we don't focus on what Peter responded with and why he responded the way he did. How does this apply? We see the Spirit's influence, though the hearers are never told until now why. The wonders in heaven and signs in the earth what were those? What does it mean why call on the Lord to be saved? We take the last two and we're going to expand on that. The wonders in heaven and calling upon the name of the Lord. The works of God displayed and the calling on the Lord. He continues, verse 22. He addresses them again. Men of Israel, hear these words. Look at what he starts with immediately after the prophecy of Joel. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth a man attested by God to you, to you by what means? By miracles, wonders, and signs, which God, the Father, did through him, Jesus Christ, in 
your midst, where they were in Judea and Jerusalem, as you yourselves know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Now, aside from the interesting play on words about attacking your audience, which Peter's just done, a very risky thing for a speaker to do, it'd be analogous to telling me telling you how stupid you all are, right, or accusing you of something, even though you did it. Peter, in that, is going directly for their heart. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you. In your midst did these miracles, signs, and these wonders. The first words out of his mouth are about what God has done with Jesus Christ. He accuses the audience of Jesus' death. He says very bluntly, he says, You have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. These are events that are well known to them. But then he also says, but that God the Father was directing it fully and completely, and there was part of the plan. Peter then begins to quote a psalm. Verse 25, for David says concerning him, Jesus, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. This is Psalm 16, one of the Psalms that is today spoken about during Pentecost. This has to do more with the works of God. He quotes Psalm 16, which mentions the right hand of God. It's called an enthronement psalm that someone is elevated up to sit next to God, and there's only two thrones. By inference, we know who it is. He says that this person, this Holy One of Israel, shall not rest in Hades, shall not rest in the grave, will be loosed from the grave to be enthroned or elevated. We know who he's talking about. His audience is beginning to understand because were these the words that the disciples spoke? Were these words from the book of Psalms what the disciples spoke as they were giving utterance by these languages? Is this what the audience might have heard? I think it's extremely plausible because he's explaining and expanding. There has to be some connection with what the tongues did when God's spirit came down. There's got to be a connection between the wonderful works of God and what Peter, he's not even halfway through, is talking about to them these signs and these wonders. He continues and he expands. Verse 29. Men and brethren, let me speak freely. He has already. I can't get much more direct. Let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us today. And because many times this psalm he has just read is applied, Psalm 16, to whom? David. It was the psalm of David of enthronement. David was king, the patriarch. Therefore, he says that he is both, David, dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. In other words, David has seen corruption in Hades. David is dead, moldering away in his grave. So this cannot be speaking about David. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God has sworn an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ, the Messiah, to sit on his throne. So Psalm 16, he says, is indeed talking about the enthronement of the Messiah that we know as Christ. Verse 31, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus, this Jesus, God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted, to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Which you see and now hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, 
David is dead and buried. He was speaking of this person we know as Jesus, who is the Christ. That is who it's referring to. This is what you have heard with the, when these tongues by the Spirit. It's also interesting, he quotes next is Psalm 110, which is another enthronement psalm. And I want you to listen specifically and carefully to the, the correspondence or the, the many themes that are brought up in Psalm 110 that were brought up in Psalm 16. They're very similar. Psalm 110, verse 34. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself, David, says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God, the Father, has made this Jesus, his son, whom you crucified, ooh, ooh, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Both Lord and Messiah. This is important. Jesus is now called Lord. The word Lord in Psalm 110 in the Greek is Kyrios. When it says, my Lord said to my Lord, it is Kyrios to Kyrios. There's Lord to Lord, Lord to Lord. And he now calls Lord, uh, Jesus, both Lord and Christ. David Capes in his book, Old Testament Yahweh text in upper in enhanced Christology, says the uses of the word the Lord in the Old Testament for God the Father are now applied in the New Testament for Jesus Christ. And this harkens us back all the way back to verse 21, where it says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Lord here is Christ. It does not in any way, in any manner, in any perspective, diminish the Father. In fact, it elevates the Father even higher. But it places Jesus Christ at his right hand. The centrality is still God the Father. This exalts God the Father. Jesus Christ had been killed by crucifixion in the grave and resurrected his first fruits to sit with God on high. There was this pattern. He sits at God, Father's right hand and he is now Lord. Again, there are only two thrones. There are only two thrones. God the Father and Jesus Christ. In verse 36, when he says he is Lord and he is Christ, this first person whom you crucified. Ugh, he's trying to explain to them that you had a part in this. It wasn't the Romans. It wasn't the Romans. But it kind of was. It wasn't the Jewish leaders, but it kind of was. It was you. It was you. He is therefore declared as God by as Lord and Messiah, the anointed one. Peter says that all mankind have a part in this. All simple, sinful mankind. Remember who he's speaking to. Some of them weren't even there in Jerusalem during the days of unleavened bread and the Passover. But there's, there's a complicity in the death. In verse 37, in verse 37, Peter wraps up this highly structured message where he has gone point by point by point. The death, the burial, the entombment, the resurrection, and the ascension as the wave sheaf offering and the exaltation and enthronement of Jesus Christ next to God the Father. He's gone through this in his message, sermon as they call it, and he continues in verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, notice what they address, men and brethren, what shall we do? It's exactly what was said in verse 29, men and brethren. But now the response is, what, what should we do? What, what, how should we respond to this? Because they were cut to the heart. Then Peter said to them this very, very famous phrase, which we jump to every Pentecost, repent and let every one of you be baptized, but in what? This is so critical in the continuity and consistency of what Peter's been saying. Every one of you to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. 
as many as the Lord our God will call. That's what you should do. In many other words, verse 40, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. 3,000 people. Peter had struck a chord. He is, his arrows hit their mark. 3,000 people. I would imagine that's 15, 20 times the number of people in this room. 3,000 people. Repent of sin, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. And effectively, you will be saved by God the Father. How did this all happen? Why did it happen? Among many points that we can talk about this Pentecost, and we've already heard a few, here are some key points that I gleaned from them and hope I'll share with you. Pentecost was the fulfillment of a promise by the Father through Jesus Christ. Jesus said to them, hang around in Jerusalem to dwell. Dwell in Jerusalem. You will be given power and you will be my witnesses to the uttermost parts of the world. Well, they'd accomplished almost all of that right there in Jerusalem, but that wasn't going to be enough. But he also said, as a promise, he said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And so it was twofold. Pentecost was both the beginning of the proclamation in a very, very unique way. This kind of gave a massive jump start to the proclamation of what we would call the gospel, the preaching of the gospel. But it was also a reminder that God would never leave or forsake his people, that we would not be left orphans. And that spirit that we talk about on this day so much, and this day is so important to us, that is what binds us together. That is the commonality along with the understanding of the truths that go with it, that same commonality that Jesus Christ and God the Father have, we're given a part of in small, utterly insignificant measure to compare to what they had. On a mathematical basis, it's infinitely more between the two of them, but they share that with us, that part of them. There's also a reminder on the macro scale that when the Spirit gave them these languages, which apparently this was never repeated in this way, we never see this, this uh, dialects and languages being used ever quite in this way. It's very different in 1 Corinthians 12 and the, the ecstatic utterances. This was a unique point in time. But we must ask ourselves, why did God give that Spirit to produce these different languages to speak those words? and for Peter to elaborate on them later. The wonderful works of God, they proclaimed, the signs and the wonders. Of what? Peter says it's the events of Passover, the days of unleavened bread, the wave sheaf offering, which Christ descends as a first fruit. This was what was on their mind. They weren't talking about Exodus. They weren't talking about the prophets of Israel and Babylon and Assyria. They were talking about the events that had just occurred. And that is what Peter expands on. We sometimes forget that. Peter's message is an expansion of the three or four verses that we read about with tongues. They proclaimed, Peter expanded, Jesus Christ's fulfillment of the multiple prophecies in the holy days, the holy days we observe. These days give meaning and structure to what we believe. If you took our belief system and you took or minimized the holy days, what pins it all together? What pins the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension to the Father without the holy days? Doesn't it give it more meaning? Doesn't it give it a continuity with what occurred in Israel? Indeed it does, and this chapter proves it. It also relates to us on a personal level. How is it how is it that these simple people, they weren't stupid, they weren't dumb, they were just average people, kind of like 
me and you. They were just like us, exactly like us. And I think that's the intent. How were they able to do the things they did? How did Peter? Peter had a rough couple of months, a rough couple of months. Peter is, remi we, we remind each other a little bit too much in my mind about Peter during Passover. Well, Peter, equal sign, denied Christ three times. We hear that at least two or three times during Passover and unleavened bread. How would you like to be Peter? It's, it's like this monkey on his back he can't get rid of. We don't want to remember chapter 2 of Acts in this unbelievable sermon. We rarely talk about it. This is his first message. It is one of the most detailed and compelling messages and, and structured messages in all of the Old or New Testament, in detail, in accuracy. And he did this on the fly. I had time to prepare this message. I know it doesn't sound like it, but I did prepare. But you know what? I've never had people baptized after one of my messages. Surely not after this one. 3,000 people. How did Peter go from near zero to hero in less than two months? God's spirit. Though I believe the disciples did indeed have some measure, and I think greater than we understand, I do believe they had a given measure of God's Holy Spirit. They couldn't have been with Jesus Christ for three and a half years and not been affected. In fact, I applaud what Chris uh, Tom said in his first message. I believe they had some measure, greater than they are ever given credit for. But you know what? They weren't perfect. They weren't perfect. We surely are not. I'm not. Ask my wife and kids. In fact, don't. Does God's spirit make us perfect? Do I even need to give you the answer? No, it does not. We are still physical. It does not, but it convicts us of sin toward repentance and perfection. Toward it. We are ever going toward perfection and repentance along the way. Does the Holy Spirit of God give us the lottery numbers? No, it doesn't. Does it make us taller, make us thinner, make us more handsome, or make us the best dresser? No, that's not its intent. That's never been its intent. But it should remind us and help us to recall to mind the deep things. And that's what God's Spirit did for Peter. It reminded him of what had just happened, what was immediately. And here's the guy who denied Christ three times, same guy who now gives this sermon that we read about in Acts chapter 2. It reminds us, it re makes us recall our, to ourselves the deep things, the important things, that this day in some way talks about us as eventually becoming first fruits as Christ was. It should assist us in calming us when we are afraid. It should manage our temper, shorten our fuse when we are angry. Mr. Budge yesterday spoke and reminded us yesterday it should slow us down when we are rushed, which is often. It should help us to remember our faith, our truths that we know, as he did with Peter. It helps us to be kind when we are not, and we particularly don't want to be. That's what it does. It humbles us when we are speaking arrogantly. It, it tells us to forgive, and if need be, forget. It reminds us to forgive and to forget when we don't want to forgive and we surely don't want to forget. It reminds us that we have been forgiven. That is the basis of our forgiving. It helps us to be kind. It helps us to, be, to say kind things when we don't want to say kind things, when we know exactly what this person needs, and we are ready with both barrels to deliver it. It, says, it tells us to love when we feel near hateful rage. It says to care for the ones we know. The Spirit tells us also to care for those often that we do not know nor will ever know. This is what Peter did. Peter knew 
about caring only for himself. I hate to keep bringing it up. That's why he denied Christ three times. He was trying to protect himself. I'm not, a, I'm not one of them. I don't belong to these people. They're crazy. That's not me. Oh, no. I never heard of them. He wanted to protect himself. And he turned around to care for at least 3,000 people. 3,000 strangers. Can you imagine the reaction of the other disciples when Peter's speaking? Right? It's not like today, you know, they announced, you know, Mr. Chris Toms is going to be giving the first message. You know, Chris takes his notes and he's dressed very nice and he's prepared and done well and he gets up and sits down. Nope, this was done on the fly. On the fly. Peter knew none of this was going to happen. Can you imagine the other disciples? They've been with this guy for three plus years. They knew him, maybe from childhood. His brother did. Jesus Christ and God also saw Peter. They weren't surprised in the least. The Spirit of God and Christ gives us this gift. It's somewhat like, a, it's a chemical term, and I know you've heard the term, and it's very important in chemistry. It's called a catalyst. A catalyst is in every gas-powered automobile in this state. You have to have it. It's got to have, it's got to have one of the longest warranties on your car. It's important, but it's what the catalyst does. A catalyst is defined simply as a substance that changes or accelerates a chemical reaction, but it essentially remains unchanged. Your car's catalytic converter, probably some platinum or palladium, it catalyzes a reduction oxidation reaction. I've got about 15 more minutes of this. It's okay. I'm kidding. <laughs> it changes the pollutants in your car. It essentially though not indefinitely, the catalyst in your car remains pretty much unaffected to do its job. It, it just is there doing its job. The spirit we are given is much like that. It doesn't change. It is ever constant. It is God's spirit and Christ's spirit. They don't change. The spirit, it does not change. It does its work because Christ lives in us. He cannot change. We must. It changes us. It guides us. He, Jesus, guides us. As Romans 12 tells us, we are not to conform to the world, but we are to conform more closely to the will of God. That's what God's Spirit does for us. That's what it did this day. So what is Pentecost? It is a fulfillment of two harvests. The wave sheaf of barley, picturing Christ and the promise of life, seven weeks and a day later with another harvest. But it's also a reminder that we hold the truth of Christ in these holy days. Christ in the holy days. That is the centrality of our faith. It is our understanding. The centrality of Christ in these holy days where God through Jesus Christ gives us a way to salvation in the enduring presence of his spirit.